welcome to Freshly Forever, a podcast that gives you fascinating insights week after week. Here's your host, Vai Kumar. Hey folks, welcome to another episode on podcast Freshly Forever. Today, I have the pleasure of having here with us Nidhi Pandya. She is an Ayurvedic gut specialist, healer and consultant. She has been transforming numerous lives all over the world with her online consulting and expertise. Welcome, Nidhi, to Podcast Freshly Forever. Such a pleasure having you. Thank you so much, Vai. This is It's an honor to be here, so thank you. Okay. And with your background in Ayurveda, can you tell listeners how it all started and how you got oriented and initiated into it? So uh, I, I was actually born in a family where my grandfather was an Ayurveda healer. So, uh, you uh-huh. know, I lived in a huge joint family. So everything, I thought that's how everybody in the world lives, actually. I was naive enough to think that way. But I basically grew up with it as a part of my daily life. Always, given that we were a family of 14 people, there was always awareness that each person responds differently to heat, to the weather, to different foods, to even different emotional stimulus, right? Like, for example, I say that if, you know, something went off, if Two of us were scolded for something. Each person responds differently. So the awareness that what you are within, what your body and your mind are within is really how you interact with the world. And a lot of the Western focus is that, oh, it depends on what you consume, but it depends on how you Uh process what you consume. And that was a big part of our awareness growing up. I did not study uh, Ayurveda till adulthood. Late, You know, eventually when I became an adult and I was studying more sociology, psychology, marketing till that point. That's But when I reached a point and I said, wow, like what's really missing in the world is this awareness of self, which comes through Ayurveda. And then I went and got years and years of formal education. And I, and I always say that it never ends. So I'm still, a, it's such a vast and amazing science. So I'm still a student of Ayurveda. But really my journey started with being born into a family which had this deep awareness. Excellent. And every day is a learning journey, right, for all of us. So, you know, it's it's a continuous process. And speaking about, um, you know, you said how each of us react to situations is all because of what we are composed of and, you know, what we are right now. So is that what Ayurveda often talks about as it relates to gunas and doshas? And can you tell listeners what the relevance of those are to one's Prakruti and Vikruti, which I guess, um, to put it in, um, you know, like very basic terms, is what you are born with and what you are post Right, right. And, you know, just again, if I put it into perspective, I'm going to start talking about what doshas are for people in a very simple manner. And then we'll talk about what uh-huh. Prakriti is and what Vikruti is in relationship with doshas. And for anybody who's listening, even if you've never heard about doshas or Ayurveda, let's just present you with this idea. So as a human body, as a human being, there are three functions that you're essentially doing throughout your life. The three functions are building, right? And they, you're always building cells, you're building nutrient, you know, you're building tissues out of the, the foods you eat. There's always a building process, which you can, of course, it's exaggerated in childhood because it's really a building phase. You're born maybe 18, 19 inches and by a year's time, you are like this toddler, right? So the building is exaggerated uh-huh. in childhood, but you have a building function. And there's another function, transformation, because we are building And then we all need to transform. We need to transform the food that we eat. When we see something or we read something, we transform that into information and memories. Uh, You know, you're transforming nervous signals all the time. So transformation is a second function, you know, that we have as human beings, a very dominant function. The third is movement and decline, right? For all of this to happen, you know, for even your arm to move or for transportation of substances, uh, to happen, there's a function of movement which is inherent in your body. And and I say movement and decline Uh because things need to be eliminated from your body, right? Even as we age, things need to kind of, you know, decline, decay, eliminate. And that is a third function, right? Now, in terms of doshas, Mm -hmm. these these are the functions. The kapha dosha is the building function. Your body is building, building, building. That is supported by this term called kapha dosha. Transformation is supported by something called pitta dosha, which transforms everything. And the movement and decline Mm -hmm. is supported by vata dosha. However, 
what we can have is a tendency to have one of these functions more exaggerated than others so in an ideal situation okay. you're building appropriately or transforming appropriately and then your movement and decline is appropriate right I, like, so in other words all of us have all three components it's just what we are kind of more dominant or made um, rather you know we tend to show more dominance exactly on, right? exactly right so, mm-hmm. so the way so the way i say right is that some so of course given the age right children will always build more teenagers in your youth you're always transforming more all the knowledge you know becomes productive work you're procreating you're having children you know teenagers or even young the more younger you are the you'll quickly metabolize and transform your food so that's dominated by transformation and your old age is dominated by movement and decline you dry up and your body shrivels up but what happens is that all of us right could have an exaggerated tendency for one of these functions lifelong for example if your body likes to build more or if you're kapha dominant then you basically are you know let's say the easiest way to see this you have more excess tissue than anybody else you're even slower right because when you're building things slow down so you're slower you may be more grounded in your speech your everything is is more you know you may have bigger eyes bigger hair because mm-hmm. everything is more you're building building if you like to transform more you may have a very active mind but you may be very sharp and focused your digestion may be hot you may react stronger to the sun because any time you have the opportunity to transform your body likes to over transform it loves transformation and and vata mm-hmm. is dominated by like more of a movement you know there are children who like to move a lot their attention is not in one place they're always fidgeting and uh, they're going from one thing to the other that could be a tendency we could have it throughout our lives the dry moving tendency so if depending on what your exaggerated tendency is now i'll go to prakriti and vikruti we are all depending on the nature of the sperm and the egg at conception mm-hmm. you are usually born right unless you're in perfect balance and harmony and all three are equal most of us are born with a dominance some people are those children who just build and sleep you know those cuddly big children or kids who break out into uh-huh. hot rashes and they are like transforming they have loose stools and hot rashes and they cannot take the sun and they are like the pitta children and there could be kids who are just uneasy and moving and fidgeting and not sleeping well because vata likes to move and not rest they could be the vata children right? mm-hmm. so that's prakriti however as you go would that be the say all the kalik and everything that happens you know would, would you categorize that as uh, vata for for the most part right like the distended stomach mm-hmm. filling the air filling in places that unease uh you see in ch- childhood it's very distinct in babies you can see these three very distinctly um and then mm-hmm. as we grow right depending on what we consume where we live what experiences we have how we interact with the world that can change your original constitution a little bit like kind of or create an imbalance would you would say and that that is called mm-hmm. vikruti right so your vikruti is is the the imbalance that has happened beyond and beneath you could be be born with a kapha dominance but you could adopt regimens which keep you which keep you healthy right or or with a pitta mm-hmm. or with a vata but as we kind of really create imbalance that imbalance is called vikruti Mhm okay and it could be the same it could be the same you could be have kapha prakruti and you could have kapha vikruti which means you've really exaggerated it even beyond what you were born with how then do you evaluate an individual do you read their pulse you know as often i have heard or you know even experienced some going to an ayurvedic practitioner or are there other means for you to be able to tell what somebody was born with and what probably is more exaggerated at this time and you know uh, that's where gunas come in but basically traditionally pulse is not was not always used right because what pulse does it is great but it's giving the power of knowing your body to another person mm-hmm. there are three tools the three tools of diagnosis that prashna so it's prashan darshan mm-hmm. and sparshan right so prashan is questioning mm-hmm. really you know with the introspection of your patient or client and you questioning that's so you 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 self question and then your 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 doctor questions you so you really get into the causes of why this happened then there's darshan which means you kind of observe your patient and say oh how they are moving how they're sitting what their features are like mm-hmm. that's that's darshan and uh, which means to observe 
And then there is sparshan, right? Which means, of course, you know, checking your pulse, but also palpating in other areas, you know, checking the distension of the stomach, for example, the knee. Uh, so there's all of these are tools and you may not have to use all of them. In my personal practice, I use the prashan and darshan much. Mm-hmm. And then I rely upon gunas. The word gunas means qualities or properties. So to understand what properties is this person exhibiting? Are they exhibiting heat? Are they exhibiting lightness, heaviness, dryness, coolness, uh, sharpness? And you look at the symptom and you evaluate the symptom for properties. For example, I think I'm going to ask you, right? For just the reason why I'm doing this is because for somebody who's never heard this before, I want to just bring out how intuitive okay. the science is, right? When somebody when somebody has a sunburn by the heat, what are some of the properties of that sunburn? Look at just the name and tell me, is it hot? Is it cold? Is it dry? Is it moist? It's dry, I would say. and um, Hot or cold? Certainly hot. Right. So you already know. So the property is hot and dry. So you know that I need something cool and moist to balance it. Mm -hmm. So then you say aloe vera. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Or or in a a hot and dry place, we'll be drinking coconut water. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to get familiar with these gunas in your symptoms, in your body, in your day. The more familiar you are with symptoms, like I will always notice symptoms when I work with clients. Right. To know, hey, this is more building, it's more grounding, it's heavier, this is probably kapha. This is more hot, it's more transformative. This is probably pitta, right? Mm-hmm. So I really encourage people to do their self-work rather than making taking a quiz or doing pulse, which you can do pulse. The quiz has very little value. But uh, to really tune into their own bodies because this is the science that empowers you. It shouldn't be the science that makes you, you know, dependent. Okay, so you are able to clearly tell what someone was born with as well and what they are right now based on how they are interacting or what whatever they are expressing and experiencing based on all your questions and, you know, like whatever you try to find by way of your interaction with them. And I tell you, no. So the answer is, is it 100% accurate? No. And it's never for anybody, whether somebody's seen your pulse or not. Because anything is your reality in this moment of time, Mm -hmm. time, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's constantly changing your body. Like, for example, right? Whether he in the world, it could be raining today. And I'd be like, oh, the earth, somebody who just comes on to earth say, hey, I visited the earth and it rains on the earth. But no, it could be a sunny day tomorrow. And then day after, it could be something else. But yes, there are regions with high, which have more rainfall than, than normal. So you see, the general tendency is that it's, you know, it's a place which has more rainfall. Mm-hmm. So there's a, general, there's a general tendency, that general prakriti that you kind of examine. And it's a very general understanding and it should be a general. Even in the places where there's a lot of rainfall, there could be a drought one day. Mm-hmm. You, know? mm-hmm. you see the prakriti and the vikruti of the earth and different regions on the earth. I personally... Uh, Uh, I am working with this concept called the inner climate, right? It's my own method of working inspired by Ayurveda. When instead of confusing people with doshas, I'm just going to get them, you get familiar with what is my climate in my body. Is it like a desert, hot or dry? Is it, is it like monsoon? Is it hot? Is is it humid? And you get a comfort understanding of your own climate so you can balance it. Like we know if it's snowing, I'll take a jacket. If, If I'm going to a hot place, I'll wear sunscreen or I'll take an umbrella, for example, right? So getting familiar with your inner world, just the way we are with the outer world, is it's something that I highly encourage. And it doesn't have to be super specific. You can have a general understanding and you're fine. Okay. And you brought up a wonderful analogy right there with the sunburn and with the aloe vera. So does that mean Ayurveda scientifically, so you give the opposite, so you don't treat like with like, but instead you try to let, you know, you treat something with like the opposite effect, unlike say like an an allergist who would probably, you know, try to give you like an allergy shot, you know, to prevent or kind of introduce the same element, but to prevent the adverse effect of whatever is bothering you. I love that you brought up that example, Vai. I mean, I just really love that because that is the number one principle of Ayurveda is the Samanya Vishesha Siddhant. Number one, which means you treat if you if you if there is a situation and you give it more similar, something similar, you will aggravate the situation. Mm-hmm. If you use a situation, you use the opposite. Right. And then to increase what you if you want to increase what you already have, then you want to add like. So the like supports like and the opposite 
kind of diffuses light. Right? So it's the it's called the uh, Samanya Vishesha Siddhanta. And you're absolutely right. Honestly, I have to be honest, it's never something that I thought about that here in the West, you want to prevent vaccine, they, uh, you want to prevent COVID, they give you a little bit of the COVID. You know, that's just, they, they function very counterintuitively. Um, and they say, let's get your immune system to be prepared for this if it comes up. Mm-hmm. Uh, completely, the, completely the opposite of uh, Ayurveda. So okay. okay. And I really want to delve deep into doing certain basics right. And that's the very purpose of this discussion with you, Nidhi, you being the expert. But before that, if you can quickly touch upon the role of emotions, say fear, anger, overthinking, and those kind of stuff, how it plays into someone feeling good or not feeling so good. So the first sutra of the Ashtangradayam, which is one of my favorite ancient texts, is Raga Adi Rogan. All the diseases which begin at emotional imbalance. Raga is lust, Adis, etc. So anything that goes wrong in your body, any disease begins with an emotion. Mm-hmm. Because even if you eat extra, you're basically greedy. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a big part of it, right? Now, there are two aspects of it, and I want to touch upon both briefly. One aspect is every emotion will support one of these functions, mm-hmm. right? I'm going to just help you. Uh, I'm going to get your help now. Again, getting into the gunas, the properties, the qualitative aspects of things. Now, you talk about, uh, uh, you said overthinking, right? Mm-hmm. Or anxiety. Does that have movement? Of course, it's an intuitive concept. Is it a movement? right in your nervous system or is it like a sluggish denial depression in your movement system in your nervous system i would say um movement because i think it's dynamic depending on the situation you know certain things can make me think a lot certain times certain junks junctures i would just be content with okay i can just be easy and move on Absolutely right. So it's it's it supports movement. The guna of overthinking is movement because in your brain you had a thought. Now the thought is ruminating. It's staying and it's mm-hmm. picking up pace. It picks up pace. For example, it's just the more you think, the faster it moves in your brain, and then you can't take it anymore. Right? Kind of like now, fight or flight mode. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. And sometimes there's freeze mode where you just go shut down. Um, but so so you tell me. So in that right, when we talked about the three functions, we talked about kapha, which is more building ground slower we talked about pitta which is more transformative and hot and there's the third vata which is movement and decline so if this is movement and vata is movement right this emotion will aggravate vata which okay. means you will be drier and mm-hmm. then of course there's a whole science into everything that goes with that which means you will stay up more you'll be more anxious you'll feel more depleted you'll be more tired etc so every emotion, I'm going to ask you another emotion just very quickly. Anger, is it hot? Is it, uh, uh, you know, what, like, is it hot or cold, for example? Hot. Hot, right? And pitta is, is hot. So people who are angry are usually can feel very hot. They can get acidity. They can get... So every emotion can support a corresponding reaction in your body. Today in the West, so that's the one aspect of it, right? In fact, in the first few sutras of the Ashtangradayam, which say, what will increase vata? It mm-hmm. says chintia. Chintia is a word besides movement, dryness. It says chintia will increase vata, which means when you're thinking too much, it will increase vata, right? Depression, sluggishness will increase kapha because it's an immobile. It holds mm-hmm. it's in the same place. Emotions have a very, very big role, not only in the way they respond, interact with your body, but in terms of the choices you make in the world. So from within to outside, Emotions will determine how you interact with the world. Now, that's the second aspect, Vai, is that every emotion Mm -hmm. has a corresponding chemical reaction in the body, right? Very simple. I'm thinking about, let's say, the loss of a loved one, which has not even happened. It could be so powerful that I could release tears. That's a Mm -hmm. chemical reaction, right? Mm -hmm. So one thought, which may not even be real, has a chemical reaction. With that, every single thought, 24-7, alters your body's chemistry. In the long term, the chemistry will alter the biology of the body. And again, you have your health is affected because your biology. I mean, we are being fed by this transportation, nutrient transportation system, your blood, your plasma. 
that goes all around the body and every thought changes your blood chemistry then it's a no brainer that how important emotions are emotions that are in equilibrium to what your body is the nutrients of your body very mm-hmm. very important mm-hmm. so that being said emotions big role in the choices you make in the climate and the environment of your body um and i'm so glad more and more we're talking about this today okay and i'm going to please ask every listener to kind of absorb what you just said and then because i am going to come back to it in a little bit but i just want to as we talk more about doing basics right but i want to start with the role of hydration you just said the air element vata dryness so much right movement what about hydration how important is it several people think oh morning i get up i gulp down a liter of water or like you know okay four cups of water what is the role of doing things correctly so as not to disturb the equilibrium or the internal climate that you're talking about Why I have to say that you're very intuitive about this science. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. You can oh, thank really you. take it in uh, in in a very deep manner. I love it. Uh, and you know, this is one of the things that I see. Right? What is the journey? We start off in youth, like grape, and we end up as raisins. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, old age we are like raisins, all wrinkled. And the difference between the grape and the raisin is. the loss of water content the dryness that sets mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so then the preservation of youth and the preservation of longevity is preservation of those fluid elements but the fluid elements are not just hydration and water mm-hmm. that is the important part mm-hmm. flu- the fluid elements has everything that's soft and fluid most importantly good fat right so water is very complicated because water can change which membrane it is in given osmotic pressure mm-hmm. right and and you have to think about it like even if you've ever worked in a in a farm right it's the, the farmer is very careful about how much he waters how he waters whether even if you have a plant at home you cannot just dunk a bucket of water oh yeah now, absolutely right? yeah there's a certain time it will absorb water better there's a certain speed it will absorb water you can't put it in one part so similarly we have i think over hydration is a problem right because you know over hydration is 100% a problem because you're there's there are membranes in your body you know it's like let's say the concentric circles and this the exchange of fluids is such a big part of it how it goes through every membrane mm-hmm. and we kind of distort that function when we just guzzle crazy amounts of water even though it goes through our gi gastrointestinal tract and i whether you know fluids are separated and all of that happens but still um, it's very important that being said i say you drink in ayurveda you drink to thirst mm-hmm. drinking excessively affects it's like a monsoon in your gut it's going to make it slimy give rise to parasites kill your agni things won't grow properly uh, your agni is a digestive fire so you don't overhydrate i say you drink warm water sip by sip to thirst throughout the day more in the first half less in the second half of the day and um and then your body already knows that happens when it's sip by sip it's lateral it's slower absorption you're not guzzling everything goes right the temperature of your body being warm blooded is kept intact that being said you you make sure that you're not depriving your body of fats at all mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right so of course you always support in india in indian food there's always a concept of a vaghar which means you temper your spices mm-hmm. in a good fat that's brilliant because the spices which are their hot nature will help in the breakdown of the fat so your fat is being broken down nicely you're not doing crazy amounts you're doing in moderation throughout the day you're oiling your body but not depriving yourself right some people are like oh, this is an amazing chickpea salad it has no fat it has nothing it just plain oh, yeah. oil <laughs> i'm like that is the problem if you put the fat and you put the spices i will take it right so for example um i think that's the one basic principle keep fats and keep spices in all your foods of course depending on how much you can take and digest you doesn't have to be great amounts uh, but that's your key to preservation of life okay and so we really can't emphasize more that there is no one size fits all approach to anything for that matter and so hydration okay get it as i understand you get it from 
the nourishment from the food that you eat say like cucumber provides hydration right so and then all your fats so the essential fats that's why they are called essential i guess and yes, um, absolutely and moist foods like you're absolutely right right mm-hmm. so you know like uh, like the sweet potato would provide more moisture than let's say a cauliflower right or drier foods that provide less so just being mindful of that to have moist fluid foods which have like that that structure within as well provides okay so on that note then several people think starting their day with like what are with lemon and what are with lemon and honey and so much more right some say okay ginger this and that again is there a one size fits all approach there and what is your recommendation for anyone to start their day right and so give themselves like maybe like a an alkaline start i guess alkalinity is the key to maintaining good health correct so i would say and i'll tell you what the concept of that inner climate is you know yeah. because i'll tell you uh, why people who are, even people who are in the medical field right what is alkaline it's just a concept in our minds it's not intuitive it's not something we can understand touch feel i say rough you can understand i say smooth you can understand alkaline oh it's good it's i've heard of it so i stay away from those words because my main work is to make the science more intuitive but mm-hmm. yes that being said you're right assessing what is your internal climate and how do we bring it back so let's go to the drinking water in the morning right a slight stimulation with some hot water and a substance in your in your body is not always a bad thing right you kind of waking up your digestive system you don't need to but you can drinking tons of water anything more than half a cup or one cup depending on the size of the cup i would say is detrimental to your health because your agni is now like becoming slimy early in the morning there's already dew in your garden and you're going to put more dew in your garden you're going to put you know you think whether you're walking on the grass in the morning it's moist your body is also moist you have eye boogers nose congestion you want to just keep it away from that okay adding substances to it yes for some people dried ginger could help for some people honey does not you go with hot substances so honey is always out of the game but using a little bit of lemon sometimes can help if you had a lot of greasy food at night you know just how you use lemon to clean your plates mm-hmm. you can add a little bit of lemon if you had let's say a big greasy meal at night so depending on what you're experiencing yes you can add a substance and have a little bit of water and stimulate your digestive system period so it's not one size fits all but it can be done and in terms of um, i i forget your second question there was something else that we talked about right now um i guess yeah how you uh, give yourself a good start in the morning so what is it that you do um and then when we said alkalinity you said yeah alkalinity you- alkalinity yeah 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 okay so the alkalinity right so that's where i say the inner climate the inner climate of a human being is you know you say oh ph 7 oh i mean like right there right what is it it means and you say so the, it's easier to understand alkaline when you understand acid because we are familiar with acid you know uh, and that's why oh the opposite of acidic is alkaline right but i'll just give you a very simple understanding right your body is warm blooded and this is my concept of the inner climate that we are warm blooded we thrive best in warm environments not hot mm-hmm. not hot not cold not humid not dry so kind of lukewarm lukewarm and moist okay right so even if you look at ayurveda and you look at the properties of pitta kapha vata you see whenever you talk about balancing them you're actually bringing everything back to warm and moist your breath is warm and moist your blood is warm and moist the mother's milk is warm and moist mm-hmm. your reproductive fluids are warm and moist all our comfort foods are warm and moist uh, the probiotic environment is good bacteria where does good bacteria exist where does good flora and fauna exist in the world where it's warm and moist it's too mm-hmm. humid we have parasites and mosquitoes it's too dry and hot or cold nothing will grow on it warm and moist is very thrive so you want to kind of always bring your climate back to warm and moist you could be hot and dry i could be cold and humid assessing what is my internal climate will determine my journey to warm and moist assessing your internal climate will determine your journey to warm and moist right but that is the assessment the assessment of the dosha the assessment of the internal the inner climate is understanding your ecosystem and bringing it back where it needs to be okay wonderful and i guess yeah too much you know water when we talked about that probably again we all tend to say oh when it rains a lot or when there is like you know excess moisture then mold bre- breeds and you know there's like so much fungus and room for all of that so i guess everything has a meaning right so um, 
doing it in abundance is not, you know, perhaps the right way. And maybe, you know, it can also cause that over dilution of fluids also tends to result in us losing other nutrients too, perhaps, correct? Depending on how your body is doing transportation, right? There's never anything good in excessive fluids, right? It's dilution of nutrients. Sometimes it's it doesn't trans they, they, they will not be transported as well. Everything can happen. In Ayurveda, there are diseases associated with Ati Ambupana, excess drinking of water. There is no place with, there's not much talk about dehydration, but there is a whole talk about Ati Ambupana, drinking excess fluids, excess water. So 100%, right? When we say we are made up of 80% water, it means 80% fluid. Mm-hmm. And we always protect the fluids. We always bring them in, but we be very gentle about their transportation. We don't dump and dunk our body. We forget what a complex machinery this is and we have to be very intuitive and gentle about it okay okay perfect what about standing and drinking water and athletes we see them doing it all the time and is it true that standing can impact your joints so you really have to sit and sip and not gulp your water down or is that just a myth that needs to be busted here. No, so it's not a myth, right? You want to sit and consume. And I want to tell you that, so your agni is this hot environment and your your anus actually is like a vent, right? It dilutes. So the, the function of stools is to give a base to your agni. And when you sit in, in cross leg, or even sometimes, let's say, if you cannot do cross leg, when you sit down, you're basically shutting off the vent. You, you shut off the vent and you say, I'm going to increase the heat here. It's one of the biggest openings in our body, right? That you use every day, uh, right? I mean, you could have, you could do childbirth and your vaginal canal opens up once, but your that's one opening, which is very flexible, the anal opening and opens every single day. So when you're sitting down, the musculature is that, that you kind of close that mm-hmm. muscle. And when you close that muscle, there is increased, it's a very intuitive science, right? So then you're protecting your agni of your gut. And then when you're drinking water, the breaking down of that water is going to be very, very appropriate. Okay. So any consumption, so you can support your digestive fire, should happen in sitting position. Of course, there are always, you know, we'll, all, we'll always break some rules. But just being mindful of what rules we are breaking, right? Like an athlete is like, listen, I, I, my, my, my mission is to play this sport right now. I'm going to do this for now. But then I would recommend to the athlete that whenever possible, sit down and drink. Okay, perfect. That, that's a great thing to, um, you know, take away here. Back in a moment with our guest on Fresh Leaf Forever. What about um, Agni, the digestive fire? We talked about emotions. So, and we talked about doshas, we talked about gunas, right? What is the role of Agni in someone being at their robust health? And what about the doshas, vata, pitta, kapha? And can Agni differ based on the body types or the categorization? Absolutely. So Agni is extremely important, right? I mean, it's what Agni is your digestive environment in the gut, which supports a uh, breakdown of your food, absorption of nutrients, transportation of nutrients, right? Uh, so really, digestion, mm-hmm. absorption, separating nutrients and waste, and then sending them off where they need to go. So you are only as strong as your Agni is. You can, I have not met a single person who says mm-hmm. my Agni is fine and I'm not. And, uh, you know, if there's any disease, it starts, I mean, in your physical realm, Agni becomes a part. Even if it's an emotional realm, eventually Agni will become a part of it. Now, 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 if the job of Kapha is to build, 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 right, is to break down at a slower pace because it wants to build, would you say the Agni then? And the reason why I'm asking you, right, because I want the listeners also to become intuitive about it, right? So- oh, absolutely. I think I... I- I'm really enjoying this conversation and I hope every listener, you know, this podcast has reached six continents and uh, several, several cities worldwide. So I really am hoping that, 
yeah th- this is just the way to go. yeah so why my question to you is that so if my if the function of kapha because we are saying how agni differs in doshas if the function of kapha is to slow down the breakdown you think the agni will burn sharper if you want to slow cook something is the agni going to bring burn sharper or duller oh it's going to be a very gradual process i would think so kapha has lower agni because mm-hmm. it builds more so kapha if you have a dominant kapha prakriti or vikruti and you're like oh my god i eat so much i build so much because your agni is not breaking things down right pita if pita transforms quickly will the agni be sharper or duller it's probably going to be very rapid very right? sharp right just burns things up right like lava so generally people with pita pita can they can have soft bowel movements go to three times because they body breaks down vata okay. is volatile it's wind on a windy day you're making a bonfire doesn't work on but it could be because it's very volatile sometimes it's windy sometimes it's like it's a volatile thing it's moving all the time so with vata it could be volatile agni which means it's it can burn well one day hungry one day i'm high i'm hungry one day i'm not hungry one day i'm constipated one day i'm not constipated and that could be your typical vata digestive in that okay makes a lot of sense then does it mean okay we all live in a fast paced world right and people are eating and sleeping at like odd times what is the best time of the day to consume the bulk of your food so you can absorb all the nutrients and what are the do's and don'ts when it comes to not disturbing your agni or how best can you build your agni and anybody listening to this the first thing i want you to know is that ayurveda is the science of flow of finding your flow so don't let any of this information make you rigid and be like oh my god now i have to do this right because by that token okay the flow is going to be disturbed you understand the beauty and the order of nature and you embrace it with love that's the way to follow ayurveda i mean only then can you be ayurvedic but if you're going to be like oh, i have to eat that fa- you know ayurvedic right mm-hmm. it has a mm-hmm. flow because you're working in flow and harmony now that being mm-hmm. said right just the gentle understanding of how we are diurnal mammals we wake up with the sun and we sleep with the sun and the sun determines all our cycles and how we function when to sleep when to wake okay up. so when the sun is at its peak and the metabolic activity is the highest your agni corresponds with the sun your agni is the highest when the sun is highest so lunch time around 12 1 uh, is when your digestive fire will do the best job of digesting your food when do you go to bed when the sun is down when the sun is down there's a slow down and by 10 between 10 and 2 are the best hours to be asleep so you want to ideally sleep mm-hmm. as close to 10 as possible right but all our cues it's such an intuitive science whatever activity you want to do let's see what's happening in the world outside and understand what might be happening in the world inside and then take that gesture and if you did that what you're doing is essentially swimming with the tide instead of saying i'm mm-hmm. going to eat dinner your body is swimming against the tide at every given hour there are certain juices i'm going to call them juices people can call them hormones neurotransmitters i'm going to just call them juices the certain juices mm-hmm. released at different parts of different times in the day those juices support certain activities and while those juices are still living in your body you want to conduct those activities so they happen effortlessly and they happen with ease whether it's sleeping at 10 because you have higher melatonin or whether it's eating uh, lunch at lunch time because you have more digestive enzymes okay what about warm versus cold foods and what about cooked versus raw and we all live in a day and time in a society where cold beverages are more preferred and they are consumed heavily with meals so what is your suggestion what is the best method to follow yeah and so why these are all great questions but i want to first start talking about you said in this generation right so why if you see that in our generation everybody has a chronic problem chronic joint pain mm-hmm. chronic you know oh, 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 mm-hmm. have higher cholesterol at 30 a little bit high blood pressure at 35 or endometriosis or my pcos these are problems we've learned to live with for our whole life right that oh yeah autoimmune auto conditions, conditions you know how many we have plethora of autoimmune conditions exactly right and in the generations before us 
people lived, they lived healthy. And then suddenly, you know, you could have, because we didn't have great critical care, you could die in an accident, you could die in a natural calamity, you could die, you could get your cancer and die, or have a heart attack and die, right? Mm -hmm. But people were not living Mm -hmm. so much with chronic autoimmune, thyroid, digest, all these issues, right? So we've kind of created a lifestyle, a chronic lifestyle, which gives rise to chronic conditions. And these are chronic problems we have. For example, drinking a cold beverage. Now, when you lovingly understand that my body is a warm place, I'm warm blooded. I feel the milk when I nurse my do- my child and I see it's warm. I see the blood when I give blood. I feel my urine that it's warm and moist. It's understood from, you know, anybody, right, understands that transformation requires heat. I cook my food, I require heat. Then how can my gut be a cold place? What can cold water do to my gut? Of course, it's not, Mm -hmm. you are not supporting the environment your body wants to preserve, right? As a result, as a result, we have, because of these chronic habits, we have chronic disorders. So completely... Mm -hmm contraindicated does it mean you never have a cold beverage again no you know find a summer day find an afternoon take a sip or two you know enjoy experience it a little bit if you choose to that's not your everyday thing it's not what you do every day it's not the habit you want right similarly cooked versus raw foods when you go back into the history of the homo sapien the homo erectus species the minute the fire was discovered in the world the evolution of our species kind of really expedited because fire Mm -hmm. allowed for our brains to become stronger and bigger because we were using more energy in our mind rather than our digestive systems. Raw foods Mm -hmm. will make you use more of that energy to break down your food. Your body can only, your hypothalamus, which gives a pituitary, which gives instructions to what's happening at any given point. How do I use my resources Mm -hmm. in the body? If all your resources are used to break down food, I say, what you eat comes out in your stools looking the same. So that journey, right? If your journey from a raw broccoli to looking at to your stools is going to take so much energy, support your body, cook your foods a little bit. Some people say, oh, human beings are the only species that cook their food. We are the only species that do so much, so many things. We are the only people who drive cars. We are the only people who are on computers. We are the only people who interact and think and write books. We are different. We're intelligent species. So let's use that intelligence for our body. Perfect. What about microwaving? free freezing refrigeration all these things that we do and what again is the most ideal or preferable method when it comes to warming up our foods cooking our foods so yes that's those are great questions right and now Give, understanding the limitations of modern life, the lack of support system, right? With all kindness to that, I understand that sometimes a single mother with children can't, mm-hmm. you need to do it, forgive yourself and do it, right? But if you're talking health perspective, I can't say it's healthy, right? There are times we have to forgive ourselves and do things and that's fine, right? Because you want to be easy on, you cannot be so harsh on yourself. I strongly believe it. But what microwaving does, it's saying, hey, how do I produce heat without applying heat? Producing heat without Mm -hmm. applying heat is saying, I'm going to go within the cellular structure of this food, stimulate the molecules, create so much friction within them that that Mm -hmm. it's going to now generate, the friction is going to generate heat. So it's almost like an agitation internally that happens, right? It is an internal agitation that happens. And, you know, I mean, the way your body has the memory, everything in the earth has a memory of everything else in the earth. Your body has a memory, right? You put potatoes, for example, in earth as compost, it will disintegrate. You put plastic, it won't Mm -hmm. because your earth doesn't recognize plastic. Your body doesn't recognize something with the molecular structure of which has been altered to this degree. Your body doesn't know what that food is, right? It will try its best. And it will do a certain level of digestion, but it's not the, there's no prana in that fruit. Prana is that essential, subtle life code that things carry. It's a subtle life code that I'm life, I'm supporting life. And you're killing that prana. Same thing for refrigeration, right? If you refrigerate uncooked food, you can still do it. Let's say you have grains and flowers and you want to refrigerate it. All right, you can do it Mm -hmm. for the sake of convenience. Traditionally, things were kept in silos, but that's fine. But if you're going to cook your foods Mm -hmm. and, you know, Agni has Agni Sanskar, you already put fire on your food from the external world. Breakdown has begun at a rapid degree. And now you say, hey, I'm going to put you and freeze you. And that life stops. I'm going to the prana, which has just been evoked in you, you know, 
now I'm going to say shut up to the prana. I, feel, I say it's like going on a ventilator and coming back. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That life, something, the prana, it's very hard to keep that intact. So, so we are kind of playing around or disturbing the equilibrium, so to speak. Yes. And that subtle code, which is carried, mm-hmm. right? You're, you're, you're disturbing the subtle code. Of course, people have conveniences, but I say there are other ways that you can find that don't cook your food. Sometimes I say soak your grains, right? So we all eat beans need soaking. I've had clients where they're like, oh, I don't have time to soak. I'll just use canned beans. Mm-hmm. In that case, I say, when you bring your beans, soak them, mm-hmm. dry them, and then freeze them. So the Agni Sanskar has not happened, but you have ready, you know, you have beans that you can just boil. Mm-hmm. You're still, so you, we, we all, as we evolve as a human species, we make some adjustments, right? I wish we all lived on farms and had farm to table, but we do it in the most respectful manner, the changes we make. Okay, perfect. Then any recommendations on, say, for whomever is listening to this podcast, hey, I want to cook fresh. Okay, I'm now motivated to cook fresh. What are some simple takeaways in terms of, okay, just make this rice and dal and, you know, like, or steam some vegetables. What is your, what is Nidhi's go-to? I know Nidhi is a very busy person. So what does she do in her life is what the listener is going to wonder. So what is it that you do, Nidhi? And what are your recommendations? Absolutely. So I think the tools in your kitchen are a big deal, right? So I have a slow crock pot. So it's like a slow cooker. I think in certain cases, you can even use a pressure cooker if you need to, right? Uh, but but, but so, so I have both. I have a pressure cooker and I have a slow cooker. Mm-hmm. When, I'm just going to give you guys simple things of what I do. At night, we always soak a porridge in the slow cooker. It's either cooking overnight or in the morning I turn it on because I wake up really early and it's cooked. It's soaked grains, whether it's oatmeal or it's uh, it's bajra, depends on the, the season, whatever mm-hmm. it is, right? It's soaked and that's that's breakfast five days a week, right? So I don't, okay. there's no cooking time that goes into it. I so it's like everything. oats or millets or whatever that is. Okay. Whatever that is, right? And there's no cooking time that goes into it, active cooking time. It's happening mm-hmm. by itself. But that crock pot, right? Then I recommend that you have one of those salsa choppers, which chops everything mm-hmm. very finely. So that's one of the big things. My lunch will always have a grain. Mostly it's sona masuri rice. Will always have a lentil. And sometimes they can be put together in your pressure cooker, you know, if you mm-hmm. want to make a khichri or you want to make, but the rice and the lentils is always a part of it. And then there's always veggies that are done in that salsa chopper. And then you kind of put it together either in a bowl form, either in a khichri form, either in a pulao form, either in mujadara, whatever cuisine you want to eat can be done ayurvedically. But the lunch is always a big meal. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the grain, a lentil, veggies, greens, all of it made in the most seamless, easy way manner. And Not what to- is your fat there? So because people say, oh, I cook with olive oil, I cook with avocado, I cook with sesame or I cook with coconut. What is that fat? Okay. For me, it's ghee, right? I'll tell you occasionally, yes. Occasionally, I'll use mustard oil in the winter, right? Occasionally, I'll use coconut oil. Depends on what I'm cooking. Occasionally, sesame oil cannot be used every day. It causes skin conditions. But occasionally, I'll use sesame oil. Depends on if I'm eating something Asian. So it depends on that. And I don't have only Indian food. We, cause, cause even though my go-to comfort food is dal chawal, like you said, it's then my comfort food, but uh, uh, we, we don't consume only Indian because I have two daughters and it's, I think it's good. You can make anything Ayurvedic as long as you uh-huh. use a good fat and you have some spices. Now it could be cinnamon, it could be clove, it could be hing, it, and you do multiple spices in you when you can. So that's my lunch for dinner. Then during lunch, then if I want to make a soup, which we do almost every day, let's say a lentil soup. Now my slow cooker is already free. It's free from the morning oatmeal or porridge. I'll just quickly throw in the my good fat, do a vaghar quickly, throw in lentils, chopped, chopped things, put some water, and it's cooking by itself. Mm-hmm. It's 15 minutes of, pre- 10 minutes of preparation time, and it's cooking by itself. I also do a lot of roasted veggies at night, right? So if you learn to use your oven, you learn to use your slow cooker, you learn to use your crock pot, you learn quicker ways, you find efficiencies. It's not as hard as it seems. So if there's a will, there's a way. And, uh, you know, just try to keep things simple, but try to keep them fresh. And uh, we talked about uh, food and beverages. Why is it that honey is not to be mixed with anything hot? Right. So, you know, the consistency of honey, if you notice, changes a lot when it's heated. 
Mm-hmm. It can be mixed. Otherwise, honey is very... So the molecular structure of honey changes. Now, mm-hmm. even in the West, researchers have said, hey, it releases a chemical, a compound, which cannot be digested by human beings. You know, they've, mm-hmm. they've done that research. Mm-hmm. And I, that's exactly what Ayurveda said, that it's visha. What is visha? Something that's visha is poison. The meaning of visha is poison. Mm-hmm. Poison is something, anything, which a human body cannot use or recognize as 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 its own, as some is poison. So it's indigestible. What happens to things that are indigestible? Your body is confused. Your immune system doesn't know what to do. It sticks. It becomes ama or toxic, undigested waste. Uh, and that's what happens with honey. And it's just, uh, so you want to keep it in its original state and form. It's very volatile. The minute you heat it, the molecular structure gets completely damaged. Uh, so you don't apply heat to honey. And you can use it. It's a great medicine. Um, and, and it can be used in food products as long as you're not heating it. Or using it with a hot substance. So people using honey with tea, what should be done then? Avoid it. No honey. Use good. Use a little bit of jaggery. Use a little bit of rock sugar. Uh, you know, use fennel seeds or licorice for natural sweetness. Or, yeah. you know, even sugar is better. Cane sugar is better. Not a problem. Occasionally, if you really need, but don't use hot honey. In your okay. Tea. Okay. Great tip there. What about the most favorite um aspect of anyone's uh, day and life snacking so <laughs> how, how best can one remain i know several ayurvedic practitioners are not big fans of uh, snacking yeah, yeah and you know let's just put logic to it right right so so i don't want to say oh, because it's ayurveda you don't snack it's just logic to it right that when your digestive system is kind of functioning or breaking down something and pushing it down in an order Take this is the building phase when you're consuming food. Then there's a transformation phase when you're digesting the food, and there is a movement and decline phase when you eliminate. So everything in life has these three phases: Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh. Every everything. Right? Mm-hmm. So then you basically uh, saying that hey, I'm in the middle of my transformation phase, and now you put something else in the mouth, mm-hmm. and now my body has to put extra resources in the building, or I was about to digest, and now you put something now. I'm, Splitting my resources. So this constant splitting of resources. In fact, after 90 minutes of not consuming anything in the daytime, your body goes through the second cleansing, this deep cleaning process. Mm-hmm. You, because your agni gently comes up again and says, hey, is there anybody here? Let me clean out extra gunk. So that becomes, you know, snacking is like you've just washed all your dishes in the sink and you're like, oh, I'm going to sit down. And then somebody else dumps another dish. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. it's that it's it's that feeling that your body has, right? Okay. Uh, so you just you know you gently sip water if you have an oral addiction. You do breath work if you have an oral addiction, but you avoid snacking tremendously. Okay, is fruit a good snack? And what about fruits for breakfast and eating of fruits in general? What what is what are the to dos there? So why I grew up with the being the most ultimate fruit fruit lover out there in the world, right? But I do know that fruit requires a lot of support to be digested because it's slimy. Regular mm-hmm. most fruit, right? Berries and oranges and sometimes even papayas are a little bit different. Pomegranate is the best fruit to consume. Papaya, uh, pomegranate grapes, great fruit. But generally, right, the structure of fruit is that it's slimy, right? And it is it, it has a little bit of, and because of the sugar content also, it can ferment very quickly. And so you put a, put fruit in your in your garbage can, the whole trash can stinks up after some time, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? So fruit is a little tricky. Every fruit has different properties, uh, but they're all essentially very fluid. Uh, I say in the morning, when you it's already kafa kal of the day, mm-hmm, right? it's mm-hmm. kafa kal. At that point, kafa time of the day, when everything is already sluggish and slow, you don't have fruit as a first thing in the morning. And people have to do this for three weeks to experience the shift. Experience shift in energies, experience experience the shift in congestion, and just general you know, movement through the day. It mm-hmm. has to be tried. You can have pomegranate in the morning, not a problem. But you have to try this principle. Instead, once your body is stimulated, you've exercised, you've eaten some warm breakfast. If you're hungry at 11 o'clock, have a fruit. Have one piece of seasonal fruit. Again, at 2, 3 o'clock, when you're feeling a little bit of a lull and you want something, you can have a piece of fruit at that point. Those are the two points to have fruits. But this concept of, oh my God, go crazy on fruit. It can't be because anything that is jivanya, jivanya means supporting life. Mm-hmm. has the qualities of life, which means they are in Ayurveda, they are uh, they need to have some more bulk. 
They uh-huh. need to be, you know, they need to have that good fat in them, that little st- substance. And uh, fruits don't, not all fruits have that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What about, okay, we talked about doing all the basics, right? What about the role of sleep and the importance of sleep? We all live in a device control world and everyone wants to, you know, stay up late on those devices. So how best or what is the importance of sleep in helping an individual rejuvenate and feel good? Because that seems like a much ignored aspect and I want you to throw light on that aspect. Please. So uh, the night is is as important, if not more, than the day. Mm-hmm. We have, we've, all our life is about designing our day. I say, if you put half as much effort as designing your night, planning for your night, you won't have to do much in the day. Like the day will be a breeze because the three pillars in, Ayur, in Ayurveda, the Trayopastamba, three pillars of well-being are ahar, food, nidra, sleep, brahmacharyas, you, how, much you, how appropriately you use your senses. Nidra or sleep is huge from all aspects. Your body is going through free repair. Like your cells say, hey, you know, it's such a loving, oh my God, I find so feel so grateful to the body because it's such a loving service your body offers and says, hey, you know, why go to sleep? It's, it's time for you to rest. I'll do the work. Uh-huh. And, you know, all of these great juices come out to rest, repair, see what's needed, what's not needed, to throw gunk out, to process emotions. I mean, what a gift sleep is, right? Uh-huh. And it's like a mother. Sleep is like a mother says, I'll just be there for you. You don't know anything. I'm here for you. And when we don't give sleep that due importance, right? What a big opportunity is taken. What a big disrespect it is to your body. So I'd say if, you know, sometimes you have to choose between sleep and exercise. Like this morning, right? I had to choose between sleep and exercise. And I love on a Monday morning to wake up, meditate, exercise. And I said, I'll have to give up either my exercise or my meditation. And I gave up my exercise because Uh I realized that my body needed that extra sleep. Uh So sleep is even more important than exercise, I would say. Not the kapha type of sleep, that lazy sleep where you know you've gotten enough, but Uh you build more and sleep more. But you know intuitively what sleep you need. Earlier, sleep earlier, wake up earlier is my recommendation. But not to be ignored, of course, there's a whole podcast we can do on good sleep. Oh, yes. Many, many aspects of it. But all I can say is give it more importance than you give your day. Okay. And real quick, I know you need to go. Um, The role of exercise in an individual being, you know, again, feeling good, feeling healthy. And we talked about the mind-body connection and whatnot. And we have covered so much here, Nidhi. What is the role of exercise? Exercise again, Vyayama. I mean, even before we had the word exercise, Vyayama was a part of our science. And, uh, you know, your body needs to move. I mean, yoga has its own, asana has its own merits, right? Mm -hmm. Normal Vyayama, normal exercise also has its amazing uh, merits because you're, it's like you just, you take your car for a drive if you've not driven it, right? Because everything needs to be moving. Everything needs to be stimulated. When you do Vyayama or exercise, and especially asana, you're kind of stimulating certain glands in your body. You're moving your joints. You're stimulating your glands and ensuring health. We look after our muscle. Whatever we can see, we look after skin, hair. But their glands and their muscles and the body is working so hard mm-hmm. always to keep them. Exercise helps to restore their health uh, and to keep them in motion, to keep them working. So I say exercise is extremely important, but even in your mental health, right? Your, our nervous system, we just said, right, in the beginning of the podcast, that anxiety is this mobile overthinking. Mm-hmm. Your nervous system establishes, loves to go in a rut. It's like this. It, it'll catch on to this. Let's go this way. I'm working hard. I just keep working hard. Mm-hmm. I'm doing this. I'm just going to keep doing that. And your nervous system loves to this clingy child. This wants to cling on to something, right? Mm-hmm. When you're inspired, you're over inspired, right? So exercise allows you to systematically break that obsession that your nervous system goes into. And it's a gift to your nervous system to be able to do that. So it's a no brainer for every individual to exercise. Okay, what a fascinating conversation, Nidhi. And in closure, if you can tell listeners the good stuff, contact info, your courses and things like that so people can take advantage of your expertise even more, I think that would be great. 
Thank you so much, Vai. So, you know, one of the things that I love to do is educate and, and empower people to follow Ayurveda intuitively. I have a lot of courses. If you follow me on Instagram, where I'm active almost every day, I'll put out new content. You can find all the links to my courses and my bio there. My Instagram handle is my underscore Ayurvedic underscore life. I also work with people one-on-one -on -one over six-month transformation programs. But I always tell people, first start with consuming my feed on Instagram, then do a couple of my courses, do some of that self-work. And then I'm very happy. I work with a limited number of people, but I do that. But my heart is really in empowering and edu educating people to be able to live Ayur in an Ayurvedic fashion in a very immersive way. So, uh, yeah, that's it. And thank you so much. Why this was And your website and your website, just so yeah. people can... Yeah, so it's Nidhi. It's NidhiPandya.com. Uh, my courses are not all on that website, but... Uh, that on nidhipandya.podia.com to find my courses. But if you go to my link in my bio in on Instagram, you'll find everything. You'll find the courses and you'll find the the uh, you'll find my normal website as well. And I'm working on integrating it all in one place. So hopefully by the time the launch of this podcast, I, I might have that going. Okay, great. Thank you so much for such an interesting and fascinating conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And Thank I'm you. sure listeners of this podcast are certainly going to take advantage off and listeners please leave a review from your podcast or app of choice and follow me at yp kumar on instagram for all things digital media and lifestyle until next time this is why saying so long Bye.